Hi, I'm Chris. This is my second video describing building a floating point processor using Verilog. In the previous video, I introduced myself and why I'm interested in how floating point numbers are implemented. Why software uses floating point numbers. IEEE 754, which standardizes the format and operations for floating point numbers, and how the IEEE standard categorizes the values stored in floating point data fields. In this video, I'm going to use the information about how the IEEE standard categorizes 16-bit floating point values to write a Verilog module. To review where I left off in the last video, I call this first module HP class. Here, HP stands for half precision. This module outputs six values, SNAN, QNAN, infinity, zero, subnormal, and normal. Each of these return values is encoded as a single bit. The module will determine which of these six categories the value falls into, set the corresponding return value to 1, and the rest of the return values to 0. If you don't know how the IEEE standard categorizes these value types, you need to go back and watch the previous video. I'll wait. No, really, I'm in no hurry, and you need to have that information before the rest of this video will make sense. Just click the link on the top right corner of the screen. You're back? Already? Okay, let's get to it then. These are the bare bones of the module. You can see that the input value f is a 16-bit vector and the return values are all single bits. I'm going to write the module to pre-compute three pieces of state which will get used multiple times in the computation of the return values. A flag which says that all of the exponent bits are set to 1, a flag which says that all of the exponent bits are cleared to 0, and a flag which says that all the significant bits are cleared to zero. As I stated in the previous video, designing circuits using Verilog is more like writing software than building hardware. I can write code which calculates a particular expression once and then reuse its value rather than rewriting the expression into each statement which needs that value. This has the added benefit of only needing to change the logic in one place if I make an error while writing the logic. I can declare variables to hold each of these pieces of state with the following line. Bits 10 through 14 of f are the exponent bits. We can access these bits while doing the computation as if f were an array of bits and each individual bit can be accessed using a subscript. Verilog has a built-in method which can logically and together a set of bits. Using this method our code would look like this. This statement sets exp1s to be 1 if all of the exponent bits of f are set to 1. Verilog also has a binary AND operator. This statement is equivalent to calling the AND method. However, there is a more elegant way to calculate the same value. The bitwise AND operator can also be used as a unary operator which operates on a bit vector. Using the AND operator as a unary operator looks like this. The expression f14 colon 10 extracts the exponent field as a bit vector, so it can be operated on by the unary AND operator without accessing any of the other bits of f. Verilog calls this form of the AND operator a reduction operator. I suppose this is because it takes a vector of bits and reduces them to a single bit output. It should be obvious that using the AND reduction operator will be even more useful when we have to deal with the larger exponent fields for the 32, 64, and 128-bit floating point formats. To see if all the exponent bits are cleared to zero, we can use the NOR operator. If you're familiar with the bitwise OR operator in C, then it's similar to that, but after doing the bitwise OR, you apply the bitwise NOT operator. In C, we might write a statement like the following. C is assigned the value of not the quantity A or B. In this statement, a bit in C will only be set to 1 if the corresponding bits in A and B are both 0. If either of the corresponding bits in A or B are set to 1, the corresponding bit in C will be set to 0. Like the AND operator, Verilog has a NOR method which we can use. Explicitly NORing the exponent bits together looks like this. 
Finally, just as there is a reduction AND operator which returns a single bit from a bit vector, there is also a reduction NOR operator. The last bit of state we need to pre-compute is if all the bits in the significand are cleared to zero. We just saw how to do this for the exponent field, so the next line of code applies the NOR reduction operator to the bits of the significand. We've pre-computed all the state we need to classify any floating point value passed into the module, so we can finally compute our first three return values. Here you see the equation for signaling NANDs. The exponent is all 1s. At least some of the bits in the significand are set to 1, and bit 9 is 0. The obvious way to compute if we have a quiet NAND is to use this equation. Technically this works, but we can simplify it. For a quiet NAND, we know that bit 9 has to be set to 1, which meets the requirement that at least one of the bits of the significand is set to 1. This makes using the sig zeros flag to test for a quiet NAND redundant, so we can simplify our logic to be just this. And for the last case, when all the exponent bits are set to 1, we compute whether this value is infinity using this. For the two cases when the exponent bits are all cleared to 0, we first compute the 0 flag using this equation. And we can compute the subnormal flag by changing the logic to be true if at least some of the bits of the significant are set to 1. At this point, we have identified all of the oddball values. The only thing left is to compute if we have a normal number with the following statement. That is, if the exponent field doesn't have all of its bits set to 1, and if it doesn't have all of its bits cleared to 0, it's a normal number. That completes the code for categorizing 16-bit floating point values. Now that the HP class module is written, it's time to test it. Unfortunately, before I can show how the code is written, there will be a lengthy discussion needed about how we can figure out what we ought to expect when the test is run, so details of the test will be covered in the next video. Please feel free to leave comments and questions below. Click like, please subscribe, and to make sure that you're notified when new videos arrive, click the bell. Thanks.